Thank you very much uh, for uh, arranging this first of all, and for inviting me to to speak on on the gross star conjecture. So, um, so I'll I'll give four lectures. Today's one will be uh, at least to begin with will be quite elementary, so uh, uh, kind of known stuff. Um, in the abstract, I announced that I'll say something about star conjectures, but I think. It's better not to sort of go uh, digress too much into general Stark's conjecture. So I'll, I'll introduce basic objects um, uh, that are required in this talk, and then in the next talk, I'll or I'll I'll present the formulation of gross Stark conjecture, and and in the remaining two talks, we'll look at uh, some details of the of the proof, okay, of of the conjecture of the gross Stark conjecture. Um, so and. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, Shonak is very kindly introducing a lot of things that I need in my uh, in in my talks, uh, such as Galois representations attached to cusp forms and uh, lambdaic modular forms and so on. So I'll I'll touch upon lambdaic modular forms today, but hopefully you will see them again in Shonak's uh, uh, second uh, talk and it's in 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 a more. Uh, Detailed way, maybe just over Q. I'll I'll do it over totally real things. Okay. Um, yeah. All right. So let me let me start. So uh, the plan for today is is I'll introduce what L functions are, and then I'll introduce periodic L functions and some modular forms, uh, specifically Eisenstein series. These are the ones that um, uh, that will be most important for my talk. Uh, and, in an explicit way, I also need cusp forms. So I, I uh, will need to construct certain cusp forms and, and we'll do that in probably the third talk. Okay, so, so to begin with, F is a, is a number field for me. So any finite extension of Q, okay. Um, yeah, so if you have any questions, you could, as, as uh, um, Bharat said, you could uh, put them in chat or, if, if it's possible, you can even unmute yourself and, and ask a question. I think that's also okay. Um, yeah, so, um, yeah, so this, this just means that this is a finite extension. OF is the ring of integers of, of F, so all integral elements uh, of F. Then we have this uh, this usual notion of uh, Dedekind zeta function, right? So this is the uh, Dedekind zeta function, which is the generalization of Riemann zeta function to any number fields. And this is simply defined as uh, the sum over all um, uh, non-zero integral ideals uh, of norm of uh, a to the minus s. Okay, so this is norm of a to the minus s. This makes sense uh, a priori for real part of s bigger than one, and uh, it has analytic uh, uh, meromorphic continuation to uh, to the whole uh, complex plane with um, uh, only a simple pole at s equal to to one. Okay, and another expression for this is is this Euler product expression. Okay, so this is the uh, Euler product. Oops. Okay, so this is product over all primes uh, of one minus norm of p to the minus s inverse. So these are called uh, Euler factors. Okay, so each of this is, is called an Euler factor. And this, uh, I'm only sort of going over this because I'll, I'll use this term again and again, Euler factor. Is, uh, several times in today's talk at least. Okay, so more generally, if I have a if I have a character of the absolute Galois group, so this notation uh, did appear in Shonak's talk, GF. That's the absolute. So you fix an algebraic closure of F, and uh, GF is the Galois group of F bar over F. Um, if I have a character of that, I can. Uh, uh, using class field theory, global class field theory, or the Artin map, I can evaluate the, uh, the, those characters at uh, at um, uh, integral ideals of f, and so I can. So this this term makes sense. Okay, so this thing makes sense. So this is 
uh, instead of summing norm of a to the minus s, I have chi of a norm of a to the minus s. And this also has an Euler, uh, Euler uh, product uh, with just chi of p uh, uh, put in there, okay? So these are the L functions. Um, so we'll look at L functions over uh, different fields at once. And so maybe uh, it's kind of a good idea to write chi f over f, uh, uh, sorry, L chi over f like this to, to, to kind of indicate which field I'm talking about, but I'm not going to do that. I, I hope it will be clear from the context which field I'm talking about. Uh, so, so a couple of facts I would like to mention about these, uh, as I already said, the zeta function has a meromorphic continuation, and so does the L function. So the L chi s has a um, analytic continuation to C, except when chi is trivial, in which case it has a simple pole at s equal to one. Okay, and so if you have an analytic function with a with a with a simple pole or something like that, then uh, maybe the residue is interesting. Right? And so this is precisely what happens. So that's my second fact. Um, Oh, no, so second, that's the third thing. Okay, second thing is it has a functional equation. So functional equation for L chi, for, for the L function attached to chi relates L chi S to L chi inverse of one minus S. Okay, so it, it doesn't relate L chi to, um, to L chi, but L chi inverse, okay. Uh, I'll, here I'll just sort of give a, a expression for uh, Dedekind zeta functions. Uh, but the point is that values at s equal to uh, values at s are related to values at one minus s. Okay, uh, so I, I'll write. Uh, so this is the this is the degree of uh, f over q, and um, I can write the degree as r one plus two times r two. So this is the standard notation where r r one is the uh, number of real embeddings of f into c. Okay, so um, so this is equal to the uh, number of distinct embeddings of f into c, and some of these embeddings will be real, uh, and we just count how many land inside R, and that's uh, we call that number R one. So that's the number of real embeddings of f, and R two is the uh, is the pair of complex. Uh, embeddings of, of C. So complex embeddings come in, in pairs. So complex meaning embeddings which don't land inside R. So they come in pair uh, by complex conjugation. And so, um, so you, you, R2 is the, the number of pairs like that, okay? Uh, we had these Euler factors uh, for finite primes. So these things, um, and there are Euler factors at, at uh, at Archimedean primes as well. So um, at these complex and uh, uh, real embeddings. And to, to do that, we, we define these gamma functions, okay? So, so this is the first one, this is the second one. So these are, so gamma sub R, we define in terms of the gamma function, this is pi to the minus S pi two, gamma of S by two, and the complex uh, Euler factor is is two times pi to the uh, two pi to the minus s gamma s. Okay, um, and just to recall, the gamma function is the usual gamma function. Okay, so so a priori, I mean, this integral makes sense for real part of s bigger than um, bigger than zero, and this also has a meromorphic continuation to to the to the complex plane with. Um, uh, poles at uh, with simple poles at uh, uh, non-positive integers. Okay, so zero, minus one, minus two, and so on. And uh, delta f is the discriminant of f. Okay, then the functional equation is is this thing. Okay, so this is the functional equation. Uh, it relates the value of zeta s to value of uh, zeta one minus s. Uh, so so this thing, this thing, and Right, the, these are Euler factors at, at uh, Archimedean places and the Euler factors at Archimedean places at S are also related to uh, values at one minus S. And this is just some, some factor that, that you have to uh, stick in front of it to make everything work, okay? So I'm not going to explain much about this, but this is, these are the two important uh, facts that you learn about uh, L functions and you first encounter them that it has meromorphic continuation and um, it has a functional equation. Okay, so very important properties. 
Uh, the third thing, the third property that I'm going to mention and which is relevant for Stark's conjecture is this, um, um, uh, the, the residue at S equal to one. And the residue at S equal to one is, is a very um, uh, nice number. It's so, so Euler, I mean, uh, L functions or zeta function is defined locally, right? It's defined by, as, a, as a product of Euler factors. And Euler factors are, are defined for each prime and sort of prime by prime. And so you just take this infinite product. So it's a locally defined thing. But the, the, but the residue at S equal to one of this is, is related to some non-trivial global uh, invariance. And this is, uh, this is true about kind of all, this is true about all L, uh, you know, motivic L functions. Uh, for instance, the L functions attached to elliptic curves or L functions attached to modular forms that you will see in, in some other, um, in some other, Yeah, it is. so somebody asked if this is similar, functional equation is similar to Riemann's uh, memoir. Yeah, so this is exactly the generalization of that. Uh, Riemann's work to, to uh, dedicate zeta function. Um, okay, so, um, so the L functions attached to uh, elliptic uh, uh, curves and so on, you, you will see the same kind of thing. Uh, it's only uh, those things are conjectural, whereas this, uh, this thing is, is uh, is the first instance of, of things which are proven. So, so let's recall the Dirichlet's class number formula. So it says that residue of, of the dedicated zeta function at s equal to one is this term, okay? So two to the r1, two pi to the r2, h of f, r of f divided by w of f. So what are all these things? So r1 and r2, I already said what those are, okay? Uh, so you can ignore this part for the moment. Uh, it, this is just saying that functional equation uh, tells you, you can also write it as, uh, uh, as the leading term of the Taylor expansion at S equal to zero. Okay, maybe I'll, since I said it, I'll, I'll do it. Okay, so this is uh, Taylor expansion at S equal to zero, okay? So, so the leading term is, is what kind of appears uh, here rather, right? Uh, uh, okay, so what is H of F? This is this is a very uh, important global invariant. This is the uh, uh, the class group. Okay, so the number of elements in the so this is class number, and this is why it's called class number formula. This is the ideal class group of F. Okay, and W F is the number of roots of unity uh, in F. Okay, so this is number of elements in, in mu f and mu f is the number of, uh, mu f is the group of roots of unity inside, uh, inside f. Uh, okay, so, so I've explained what h of f is, what, uh, what r, uh, w of f is. Now I have to explain you what r of f is and this is kind of the, the trickiest uh, invariant somehow. Uh, so this is r of f, this is the Dirichlet regulator. Uh, so we, when we learn uh, proof of Dirichlet, uh, Dirichlet's unit theorem, this is when we kind of encounter this, this number uh, and to define it, you have to kind of recall parts of, of, the, of, the, um, uh, of the proof. So why is the <clears throat> uh, free abelian, so I'm, I'm sort of deliberately writing yf here if I need to, to change my number field later on as, as I'll need to do in the next talk, I think. Uh, so why is the free abelian group generated by Archimedean places of f? Okay. So there are R1 plus R2 Archimedean places of f. Um, and xf is, is some... <clears throat> uh, uh, a subgroup of, of this Y. So you, uh, you take the map, which kind of takes summation A, V, V. Uh, so V uh, is the Archimedean place and the augmentation map just takes it to summation A, V. So this is in Z, right? So this is the augmentation map. You just take the sum of the coefficients uh, <clears throat> and XF is the, is the kernel of this. And we know from uh, Dirichlet's unit I mean, when we, when we want to prove it, we define this map from uh, R tensored U to, uh, to R tensored X. 
the map is given by any any unit going to uh, sort of log of the absolute value at the ith place. Uh, so if i is the real place and two times log of uh, absolute value at the ith place if i is a complex place. Okay, so this is the map and uh, <clears throat> because units have norm one, uh, we know that if we if we sum all these uh, all these numbers, you get zero. So this is why it actually, I mean, a priori it's an element in Ry, but it actually lands in Rx, okay? Um, and then Dirichlet's unit theorem, it's, sorry, I forgot to write this. So, um, so Rf uh, is uh, kind of mod of determinant of this map. So uh, let me call this map. Uh, not this. Okay. Phi. Um, okay. So with respect to uh, integral basis of u and x. Okay. And so different choice of basis will only uh, change the determinant by sign. And so, so the mod wouldn't change, okay? So, or, or you just change, or another way of saying this is you change the basis so that you, you, get, the, you get a positive determinant, right? So this is the, this is the quantity RF, um, the Dirichlet regulator that I have here. Okay, so that explains all the terms here, right? So this is the class number formula. Uh, reg, uh, residue at S equal to one of the zeta function is some factors like this, and then H of F, R of F divided by U. And the formula looks a little bit nicer if you take a leading term at S equal to zero. Um, so it's minus H of F, R of F divided by the, the number of roots of unity in F. And in fact, this number also has a, has a meaning uh, which, uh, which is not written here. So this um, R1 plus R2 minus one, this is uh, rank over Z of, of U, right? So uh, of OF across, uh, okay, the, the units. Uh, so, so at S equal to zero, you have two set of information. The, the order of vanishing of uh, the dedicated zeta function at S equal to zero is exactly uh, uh, rank of the, the unit group OF cross, and its leading term is, is, uh, is this, uh, this number, okay? So it, it, once you see the formulation of Bergson and Dyer, you can, uh, you, can, um, you can see the similarities with this uh, formula. Okay, so a birth sonnet and dire, as we heard earlier today, says that um, the order of vanishing at s equal to one of, of the L function is, is equal to the rank of the model whale group. <clears throat> okay, and then there's a more precise version of uh, the, like, uh, with what the leading term is. All right, so, um, okay, so, so that's uh, class number uh, formula. Uh, and at this point, I can I can see some I can make some noises about Stark's conjectures, which is what I'm going to do. But I will not give a precise formulation of, of Stark's conjectures, uh, uh, even for abelian characters. Okay. Uh, in any case, so I, I take this. Uh, so okay. So what is the digression? So H over F is an abelian extension. So now we have uh, we don't just have F. We also have a finite abelian extension of uh, uh, of uh, of F, which I call H. And the Galois group is denoted by G. <clears throat> then we know that if if I if I take the trivial if I take the representation of the trivial subgroup of G and induce it to to G, I get the regular representation. And uh, by what is called art in formalism, uh, if if I take the uh, the zeta function of H. So one should think of this as, as uh, L function attached to the trivial character, but over, uh, but over um, kind of trivial character, but this is over H, okay? And these are uh, L functions, but uh, now over F, right? These are all characters over F. So if I wanted to write this more precise uh, notation, uh, I just don't want to carry it around. That's why I did not uh, introduce that. But uh, so, so if you if you take this character, induce it to to G, you get uh, some of these these characters, and that's why that's why it 
the L functions de L function decomposes like this. Now, if of course I can sort of say that you can you can take uh, this thing as an exercise, but I haven't defined L function for um, characters of degree two or more. So once you kind of define L functions of uh, for uh, for rep representations of dimension two or more, you can you can this this step is very easy. So you can try to if you haven't seen this before, you can you can try to uh, do this yourself by uh, j just look at definition of what uh, R T N L function is. Okay, um, then if I take the if I take the um, uh, the the leading term at s equal to zero of this. I have this, right? Uh, I should have, uh, there's a typo. So this should be R H1 H, R2 H minus one, okay? Uh, so so, so this, this expression just comes by looking at the, looking at the leading term on this side and, and then I, I plug in the RHS on uh, the right-hand side on this, okay? So, <clears throat> okay, so, so so here is what the, the motivation behind Stark's conjecture is. So we have a product on, on the uh, on the left hand side. Okay. We don't have any kind of product on the right hand side. <clears throat> so you can ask, is there a product on the on the right hand side which sort of mirrors the product on the left hand side? Okay. Uh, or in other words, you can ask if what is the expression for leading term of each of these L functions? Okay. Uh, again, I'm not going to write it down, but each of these L, you, you know exactly what the order of vanishing of each of these L functions is, L chi S. And so you can ask what the leading term is and is it related to some nice arithmetic invariants? So that we, which are kind of uh, the invariants that appear in Dirichlet's class number 45. Okay. Uh, and so, uh, so you, you can ask, is, is there a factorization of RH? Is there a factorization of H, H and, and so on. Um, so one, so, so, so as, as we saw um, on the previous slide, uh, this H of, oh, I don't know this color. Um, this H, H, this is the, number of elements in the ideal class group of H, but ideal class group of H has an action of G on it, right? Because H over F is an abelian uh, extension. I mean, it doesn't uh, matter whether it's abelian or not, but uh, anyway, so H over F is an abelian extension. So the Galois group of uh, H over F acts on the ideal class group of this. So you can ask, uh, so, so so you can take chi components in, in some way and, and you can ask whether you can sort of, uh, you can replace a, this, this H sub H by, uh, by order of those chi components and so on. But the answer is, is not so um, obvious uh, kind of what it should be because these are all integral representations, right? Representations over Z. These are all finite groups. And so, so it's tricky to kind of take, uh, take components and so on. But the but the trickiest uh, bit is this uh, this thing, okay? Uh, the the regulator, and so Grostar conjecture is precisely the situation where you where you avoid this regulator when the regulator is is one. So um, as as we'll see uh, in, in the talks, okay. Um, all right. So that's that's one. Uh, that, that's the motive. This one is the motivation behind Stark's conjecture, and so you can uh, you can read Tate's book if you like to uh, to uh, yeah and understand uh, state. I mean to to see precise statements of Stark's conjecture. So I think Tate's book is still the the best reference to 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 learn uh, Stark's conjecture. All right. Um, the second point I want to make is is sort of we are specializing towards the situation that we are actually interested in in uh, in the gross star conjecture. So now, additionally, so H over F is already abelian and finite. Additionally, we also assume that it's a, it's a CM extension. Okay. Uh, so CM extension. Uh, yeah, I'll. I'll uh, uh, so somebody says which book, and I'll I'll write the. Uh, name of the book in, in the chat later for 
for, for the record. Okay. Um, so, uh, so CM uh, field simply means that it's a, it's a totally complex quadratic extension of a, of a totally real field. Okay. Um, all right. So uh, maybe I should say here what, so, so F is called totally real if every, uh, I, I can say it like this. If, if R1 of F is equal to the degree of F over Q. Okay, so if every embedding of uh, of of f inside c lands inside uh, inside real numbers, and c m simply means that uh, uh, totally complex uh, quadratic extension of a totally real field. Okay. Another way of saying this is you you adjoin uh, square root of uh, of um, a totally negative element uh, uh, in a in a totally real field to uh, to get a uh, CM extension. So these are uh, generalizations of imaginary quadratic field. Okay, and so each CM field comes with a maximal uh, totally real uh, subfield. Okay. Um, All right. Um, yeah. So this is this is what I denote by h of f. And the and the interesting thing that happens when you kind of take the ratio of zeta h at zero and zeta h of uh, h plus of zero. So of course this this kind of should be put in quotes be, uh, because um, these are these are both zero most of the time. But what I mean is is that uh, in, in this particular situation. Um, Right. So, so for this h, uh, for this h, what happens is uh, uh, r two of h. This is two, uh, This is half of. Um, so this is uh, h over q. Right? And so, so what? What happens here is h r one of. Um, uh, H plus plus R two of H plus this is zero of course uh, minus one this is R one of H this is zero plus R two of uh, H minus one right so the order of vanishing of these two uh, two zeta functions is the same at s equal to zero and so that's what I mean by uh, I, I take the leading term uh, and and take their ratios this is what I mean by like this so I think the standard notation is to put a uh, put a star here. This. Okay, uh, okay. So um, so this is this uh, this ratio, and you can show that uh, these two when you take R H over um, when you take R H over Rh plus, this is precisely two to the power R2h minus one times some quantity Q, uh, which is explicitly like this. So, uh, so recall that uh, Uh is, this is just Oh cross, okay? And Uh plus then is, is just the, um, Units in in h plus and mu h is the number of is the group of roots of unity. So so q is simply the index like this. So q q is is a power of two, and then there's this power of two. Uh, so when you take this ratio, you end up with a rational number. Okay, so so this is uh, yeah. So this is the kind of. Uh, Okay, so you end up with a non-zero rational number. The upshot of all this is when you, uh, and, and, and you, okay, so I, I, maybe I should have written this at the end, but this uh, ratio is also equal to the, uh, the leading terms at, uh, of all these L functions where, where chi 
varies over totally odd characters. Yeah, I, I don't know this term has a unit index, but it's this index, so presumably it's. Uh, so somebody asked if Q is a generalization of has a unit index. Uh, I, I don't know this term. Um, anyway, it's it's this thing explicitly. Uh, all right, so, um, so you know that this product is equal to this rational number. And so you can, Yeah, so W, I, I, we, we saw earlier, W was uh, the number of roots of unity in H. And in H plus, so this is kind of just uh, two anyway, yeah. But you have a K here, Mahesh, what is W K? Ah, oh, that's a typo, that's just a typo, yeah, thank you. Yes, that's nothing. That's just a type. <laughs> okay, uh, so you can kind of guess that each of this number is 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 a rational number, and you can ask. I mean, each of this. So first of all, it's known that L chi um, of zero is not equal to zero for chi totally odd. I'm not deducing it from this, by the way. I'm just sort of this is this is a fact, and uh, and so you can you can. Kind of guess that this is this is rational number, and you can ask, what is this rational number individually, and and how it's related to to these things. So this is, um, oh, do I have L H plus somewhere? Yeah, in the denominator you have an L H plus and an omega H plus. What is the L H plus? Uh, I think maybe it's the class yeah yeah. This is well. just H. Yes, thank you. So yeah, so so you so each of this is a rational number, and you can ask what that rational number is, uh, and that's the that's kind of predicted by brumer stark conjecture. Uh, and again, I'm not going to uh, go into the statement or or the proof of that uh, at all. But this is just a, the, these couple of points were digression uh, towards uh, what what Stark's conjectures. Uh, Try to try to study. Okay, so we have these nice uh, classical formulae for leading terms of zeta functions, and Stark's conjecture basically asks you similar kind of formulae for uh, for L functions in general, for for art in L functions or for Dirichlet L functions. Okay, um, uh, so <clears throat> so let me now move on after this digression to p-adic L functions. So again. Um, we are restricting to the situation where uh, F is a totally real field. So I just recalled on the previous uh, slide what totally real is. Uh, it, it means that R1 is the same as the degree, which means that all embeddings of F uh, into complex numbers actually land inside R. And I also fix a, a prime number P. Okay? And, uh, unlike in most other, <laughs> Other things that I talk about, p need not be odd. Okay, so p equal to two is allowed in this case. Uh, even I mean, two is usually a problematic prime, but thankfully in in, the, in gross Stark it's not. Okay, so <clears throat> so chi is a totally odd character of f. Uh, so another way of saying this is uh, okay. Um, so, so chi is a map from GF to, uh, to Cuba, right? And so I can take uh, H to be F bar fixed by kernel of chi uh, is a CM field. Okay, that's another way of saying this. Uh, or another way of saying this is uh, each complex conjugation, uh, it sends complex conjugation to, to minus one, okay? At, at all the Archimedean places of F. So um, various uh, ways to, to say this. But chi is a totally odd character of F. And omega is, is what is called the Tychimular character. 
So this is the, the character that goes from uh, Galois group of Q mu P over F. So if F is, uh, so, so yeah, if, if P is odd, then this is just mu P. If P is even, then this is mu four. And so there's a, there's a canonical map. We saw a part, I mean, this is part of what we saw uh, in the first, uh, in Anupam's talk when we saw the, uh, or was it Shonak's talk and the, uh, the, the p-adic cyclotomic character. So this is just a, just a part of it. Um, and it takes values inside this. So this is um, uh, mu two if, uh, if p is equal to two, and this is mu p minus one if p is equal to, uh, p is not equal to two, okay? All right, so, so that's the Tycho Miller character. <clears throat> then uh, as a generalization of what I just said here, now this fact, uh, we have the following, uh, and this is a, this is a theorem of, of uh, Ziegel, Klingen, and Shintani, uh, that if you take the uh, value of these L functions attached to chi omega to the N at N, then those are all uh, algebraic numbers, okay? Non-zero algebraic numbers. And where does this happen? So this happens at all uh, non-positive integers, okay? So n equal to zero, n equal to minus one and, and so on, okay? Uh, so, so there are two different proofs of this. One is, is using Eisenstein series. This is what Ziegel and Klingen do. Um, and we'll kind of see this, uh, this later um, today, but that uh, this is not exactly Ziegel's proof. We'll see the, the proof due to Delin Ribet, um, where they also make an integral statement out of this. And then Shintani proves it by a different method using some explicit formulae for partial, partial zeta functions, okay? <clears throat> All right, so, so we have a function from non-positive integers to, uh, uh, to QP bar, right? So I can, I, can, I can embed this into kind of, uh, um, yeah. chi omega. I mean, you know, you can, um, right? <clears throat> so, so there's a function which takes N to, to this L value. Now, of course, there's a technicality because uh, you, you can have different embeddings. And so, um, so, uh, so this is not well-defined a priori, but there is a way of doing this canonically. And uh, often sort of in, in modern uh, literature, we kind of ignore this, but this is, uh, this is explained. I mean, this was pointed out by Sayer and it's explained how to do this canonically in an article by uh, Coates and Lichtenberg. I think, I think they have only one paper together. It's, it's a paper in the annals in, in 70s, so it's not hard to do. Okay, so there's a, there's a way to do this, um, uh, to make this map well-defined. It doesn't depend on, I mean, there's a way to choose a conjugate of, of these values uniquely so that it also makes sense periodically. okay? Mm. Yeah, or you could sort of, from the beginning, you could fix a, embedding of Q bar into Q P bar. All right, um, anyway, that, that paper is worth looking at. Uh, okay, so, so, so non-positive integers, these are, these are dense. Um, uh, these are dense in, in, I wanted to write say P actually. Uh, these are dense in ZP, and so uh, so the question is, um, um, uh, like, can you analytically? I mean, can is there a is the, is there a periodic uh, continuation to whole of ZP? Okay, so you can ask. Uh, you have a you have a function. So uh, from from a dense subset, can you continue it uh, to the to the whole space? And the answer is yes, with, with sort of a, a caveat, it's not exactly these values that you can interpolate, or it's not exactly these things. You have to modify them, uh, them slightly. So if you haven't seen this before, this modification might look, um, look very strange, but uh, as you kind of um, 
learn this theory and, and look at the proofs, it, it kind of is natural. So how do you have to modify them? <clears throat> so instead of taking this, this primitive L function, you have to take this non, uh, this imprimitive, imprimitive version. So this is the, well, actually some people might call uh, this thing also imprimitive because it doesn't have all the factors at infinity, but, uh, but I, I'm not doing that. I'm, uh, I mean imprimitive in the sense that I also take away Euler factors at finite places. So, <clears throat> so what I do is I take this set S, uh, which contains, you know, it can, it can contain many other places, but it, it's a finite set, uh, which contains all places of F above P. Okay, it could contain other places as well, but I don't, I don't care at the moment. Um, and so I remove those Euler factors, right? So Euler, when we took the Euler pro product, we had a minus one here, but we don't, we, we sort of multiplied by, by these things. So, so we are removing those uh, Euler factors. And this is the modification that we need. Yeah, so somebody said, is there an intuitive reason why we consider the nth power of Tyke Miller character for many, many n's? I mean, so Tyke Miller character is a finite order character. So, so actually we are only considering sort of p minus one powers of those, even though sort of n varies over an infinite set. Uh, and uh, sort of if you haven't seen this before, and this is my slides are the only things that you have seen up to now, then I don't know what to say to make this look natural, but, uh, uh, but, but there are many reasons why, why once you kind of uh, read more in, into the theory, this omega to the n is a natural thing. So the one is you, what is called the weight space. So it has P minus one components more or less indexed by this omega. Um, but you will see another sort of more analytic reason from, uh, from the Eisenstein series that we'll see later on. Okay. Uh, yeah. All right. So, <clears throat> so these are the, the values that we are going to uh, kind of interpolate. Okay. Uh, so this is the, the theorem of Casanogas and Delin Ripet. So Casanogas, uh, she, um, generalized the method of Shintani and Delin Ribet is kind of generalization of, um, of uh, Siegel's uh, method. Okay, so there is a, so what it says is there exists a continuous function, uh, in fact, piadic meromorphic function um, uh, from Zp to, uh, to Qp bar, which, which takes these values, okay, so at, at uh, non-positive integers. So this is, this is the thing, right? So at non-positive integers, it takes these, uh, these values. And in fact, it's analytic, except uh, in the case when chi omega is, is trivial, okay? Except in the case when, uh, when um, chi times omega is the trivial character, just like the, uh, the case of uh, complex uh, uh, L functions. The spiadic L function is also um, analytic if, if chi omega is non-trivial character, but at a, at a, if chi omega is a trivial character, it possibly has a pole at S equal to one. Now, why do I say possibly? Because uh, we, we don't know, this is conjectural. So the, it's, called, it's, it's equivalent to Leopold's conjecture. Um, so, so there is a pole of a uh, simple pole at s equal to one for the piadic uh, uh, zeta function as well, and that's equivalent to Leopold's conjecture. So we don't know this uh, uh, in general. Okay. All right. So later on, I'll give a very very rough sketch of uh, of uh, of the of the the proof of this theorem uh, due to the uh, Delin and Ribet. Okay, so we'll see a construction of LP, LSP uh, due to Delin Ribet later on. Okay, but uh, here's what I want to say. So um, we, we'll see a precise uh, statement next time, but what is the motivation behind uh, Gross-Stark conjecture? Um, 
and I, I think this was the original motivation, though later on kind of this had uh, uh, a much nicer uh, explanation, which uh, we won't have time to go into. Okay, um, <clears throat> but the motivation is this. So, so these L values, as I said, uh, are non-zero. I, I wrote this fact earlier that these L chi zero is non-zero whenever chi is totally odd. By the way, I did not say how this comes along. So, so this comes from, um, uh, from the, the functional equation. So, Mahesh, yeah. I have one question here, sorry. This LS chi zero, these imprimitive ones is got by dropping the Euler factors at S, right? Yes. So why do you write, uh, oh, because it's minus one, it's okay. Yeah, it's, it's not raising minus one. one. So, yeah, I'm multiplying by that inverse right, right. of the Euler factor. Yeah. So, so this, uh, well, I mean, the, the about, about this thing, this comes from functional equation and the fact that um, sort of L chi of one is, is not zero, okay? Uh, <clears throat> so if you haven't seen this before, maybe it's worth uh, trying, to, trying to show this, that when chi is totally odd. Uh, so I did not give you the functional equation for, for L function, so you'll have to, Look, look that up as well. Uh, anyway, so so these uh, num these uh, these values are always non-zero, but the value of the periodic L function at zero, this can be zero. Right? This is the expression. So you are multiplying this non-zero number by these factors. So if chi of v is one, you are multiplying it by zero. So if chi of v is zero for some v in S then the periodic L function is zero, okay? And so presumably you are sort of losing out some information that, that L chi zero gives you uh, because you just get zeros. So, so this phenomenon is called the, the trivial zeros. Trivial zeros uh, or what exceptional zeros. So two very opposite kind of names, uh, trivial zeros, because the, the zero is somehow for a trivial reason that you are multiplying it by something which is zero. And uh, I, I don't know where this uh, term exceptional zero comes from, but presumably because. Uh, I think it's because the complex L function doesn't have a zero. Yeah, yeah, so complex, uh, yeah, that I was going to say that this is, these zeros shouldn't be there, but they are there, so that's why. It, um, yeah. Okay. Um, right. So somebody asked, why do we, do you have to take the imprimitive thing? So if we, if we don't drop the Euler factors at primes above P, we do not get the adic continuation of these, uh, uh, of this function. Right? So that's why I had this yes with, a uh, with, a with a quotation mark. Okay. Uh, if, if, we, if we don't drop the Euler factors at, at primes above P, then we don't get periodic, uh, periodic analytic function. There's no periodic continuation to these things. Okay, um, so, so, so you can ask, uh, well, we, uh, my, my uh, periodic L function doesn't have any connection, uh, non-trivial connection with, uh, uh, with the complex L function at S equal to zero. Uh, when I have these trivial, when the trivial zero thing happens. But is there a meaning to the leading term of this periodic L function at S equal to zero? Okay, is there a, is there a meaning for, uh, for the leading term of, of this? And the answer is yes, and this is what Gross-Stark conjecture is about. Okay, so we'll see the precise formulation of, of this uh, conjecture in, in the next talk. All right. Yeah. So, so that's what the that's what this uh, series of lectures is about to to give a precise uh, formula for leading term of this uh, um, uh, uh, this uh, periodic L function and then uh, then to, to prove that formula. Okay, all right. So I have about ten minutes and I want to. Yeah, so just like Shaunak, I have too much material, I think. Let's see how far we can go, okay? Uh, <clears throat> so now we'll change uh, track completely and then uh, and talk about uh, Hilbert modular forms.
okay so you uh, you saw mod elliptic modular forms in uh, in in Schoenach's talk now we'll see hilbert modular forms um all right so uh, so these are generalizations of the usual modular forms uh, to totally real fields and there's a lot of notation uh, so you can kind of ignore uh, a couple of slides uh, of this notation and just if you if you if you haven't seen this at all before but you have seen modular forms then just keep in mind the example of modular forms and and see kind of what what changes here uh, to to get some idea okay so <clears throat> so f is a totally real field as as before d is the degree of uh, f over q then um, just like modular forms hilbert modular forms have weights uh, but these weights is just not just a number. It's a, it's a it's a d tuple, right? D being the degree of f over q. Okay. Uh, in this uh, lectures, we'll we'll be interested in what are called parallel weights. Okay. Which means that all these ki's are, will be equal for us. So we can just talk about weight k as a number. But I, I just wanted to. Uh, to introduce this non-parallel weight uh, uh, modular forms as well, uh, just to kind of, you know, just, just so that I can make some remarks later on when we construct the cusp form required in, in the proof. Uh, where, but it's, but non-parallel weight modular forms are, are not required at all in, in, in what I'm going to, to see. It, it's just some sort of auxiliary discussion that would happen around some construction. Okay. <clears throat> And so, so these are these are some uh, uh, d tuple, and h is the upper half plane, okay, complex upper half plane, and this is the automorphic factor, right? So if I if I have a and b in c to the d, then a z plus b to the k is is this product, right? As as usual. Um, so what do I, what else do I need? I need a uh, I need an integral ideal. So B is an integral ideal of OF. I need a character from OF mod. So this sub F is just to say that I'm taking a Hecke character and I'm taking a finite part of it. So if we, you know, don't, don't worry too much about this sub F right now. Uh, so this is OF mod B uh, cross to, uh, to Q, Q bar cross. So this is some character and CL plus f this is narrow narrow class group okay uh, so uh, so this is uh, this is usually slightly bigger than the ideal class group right so uh, we we had ideal class group earlier this is not ideal class group this is narrow class group so we only mod out by um, oops sorry it's saying i have stopped sharing this is through my phone, so it may be a little bit slower uh, to update. Uh, so I'll try not to move between slides very fast. Um, anyway, so this is the this is the narrow class group. In, uh, here, I I mean the, the difference between ideal class group and narrow class group is I I mod out only by principal ideals, which are generated by totally positive elements. Okay. <clears throat> All right, and then I, uh, so, so we have these groups like gamma n, gamma zero n, and gamma one n, and so on. So this is the, this is the analog of that uh, for totally real fields. So it's a bit more complicated. Uh, I take all uh, uh, matrices in GL to F uh, such that A and D are integral elements. Okay, so rather than taking something in GL to Z or SL to Z, I, I kind of allow uh, elements in F, but A and D are integral. Uh, I don't know why this went. This is not sub epsilon. This is just um, belongs to this this thing. Okay, um, is in uh, T inverse D inverse. So I'll say what T and D are. So D is the different of F, and T lambda is a fixed ideal in 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 the in the class lambda. Okay, so, so I have this narrow uh, ideal class lambda, and for each lambda, uh, you know, uh, I, I will fix a, an, I an integral ideal t lambda. So a lot of things will depend on this t lambda, these, these choices of lambda. Um, 
So B is in T inverse, D inverse. C is in <clears throat> uh, this, this level, the, the ideal that defines this level. So B uh, times T, uh, T lambda, D lambda. So if you just think about uh, Q, then it simply means that A and D are in Z. B is in Z because different is one and, uh, and uh, the, the, the narrow class group of Q is trivial. So for T lambda, you could just take the ideal generated by one. So this is in Z and C lies in B. That's what it means, right? So, so it's kind of uh, uh, yeah. like Z, Z, uh, this is in, in B, Z and Z, okay? this kind of thing, okay? Um, so this is what this group is. <clears throat> so, so the space of Hilbert modular forms of level B, uh, Neben type uh, psi, let's see, you, you saw this word uh, earlier. Uh, weight k, so k is now a uh, tuple of uh, d uh, uh, non-negative non, non integers uh, are, so instead of having one meromorphic function from upper half plane, you have h meromorphic functions from uh, upper half plane to the d, sorry, this should be d, uh, to c, okay. So, so I have a I have a collection of f lambdas from uh, okay. so so there are all these functions and they have to satisfy certain uh, modularity condition. So, what is the modularity condition? If I slash f by gamma, I get psi f of a times uh, times uh, f of uh, f lambda. Okay, so I should have some Zs here as well if I'm writing. And how is the slashing operation defined? It's just defined like uh, like it's defined in uh, defined over rational numbers. Okay, so this is the definition of the slashing operator, and this is what the modularity condition is that if uh, f slash gamma of Z is psi of f times a uh, f lambda of Z. Okay, so. So what is this 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 gamma? This gamma um, is um, uh, is an element in in inside GL two of F, okay? but I can take all its embeddings into R embeddings of F into R, and I get a I get a D tuple of of elements in here. This is this is how this is how I, I get my my gamma. Okay. So that's the definition of, uh, of uh, modular form, Hilbert modular forms. And a remark is uh, kind of, I said holomorphic function from upper half plane. Uh, usually you, you want uh, uh, sort of holomorphicity at cusp forms. Uh, it's not cusp form, at cusps. Uh, but if F is not Q, then, uh, then this is automatic. So you don't need to, <clears throat> to talk about holomorphicity at, at cusp, this is automatic. Uh, when f is different from q, just owing to the dimension of, of uh, h to the d. Okay. Uh, all right. So, so the module as as with uh, with usual modular forms, the the modularity gives a q expansion, and then again, as you can imagine, it's a bit more complicated uh, uh, when um, uh, when you are when you are away from q. So there's a Q expansion. Now the usual Q expansion is indexed by, uh, by non-negative integers. Here we, we don't have that. I mean, you, you have each of these uh, F lambdas. Sorry, what's the time? Okay, I'll, I'll, just, uh, I'll just finish this slide of normalized uh, uh, Fourier coefficients and then stop. And next time we can start with examples, which are Eisenstein series as, as my primary examples of uh, modular forms. <coughs> Okay, so, so this has Q expansion and this is indexed by totally positive, L so firstly zero and then totally positive elements in uh, inside this. So this means, uh, this means totally positive, i.e. sigma of B, um, is bigger than zero for every 
sigma in harm from F to C. Remember, any uh, field homomorphism from F to C lands inside R, right? So I can talk about whether something is positive or not. So it's indexed by, by these things. So, so these are the these are the Fourier coefficients, a lambda zero and a lambda b. And this is just some exponential as you know, usually you have e to the power two pi i z uh, for over q. Here you, you have this. Okay. Uh, the, again, sorry, there's a type. Uh, maybe I'll I'll do this. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So these uh, the, these Fourier coefficient depend very uh, strongly on t lambda. Uh, now, if I want something which is independent, it's possible to do that. And these are what are called normalized Fourier coefficient. Uh, and these are the ones that we'll be working with. These are the these are the relevant ones. These are the ones that are uh, related to Hecke eigenvalues. Uh, if you if you happen to if your f happens to be a Hecke eigenform as uh, Shona was saying in the, in the morning. So he was talking about Hecke eigenforms. So these normalized Fourier coefficients are the ones that, that, uh, that are more canonical than these ones. So how do you normalize them? You just uh, divide by norm of T to the K minus two, uh, K by two. So, yeah. So, uh, so these are the Fourier coefficient or the Q expansion coefficients as they are called. Okay, so, so whatever I'll be doing is, is kind of very explicit. And this is why I, I, I mean, I gave all these um, uh, definitions because I'll be working with these uh, Fourier coefficients. Uh, so next time we'll see uh, examples of, uh, of modular forms and the explicit, there are, only, there are very few uh, cusp forms that we can write explicitly. The, the modular forms that we can write explicitly are Eisenstein series theta series, and then basically this delta function that Ramanujan wrote down. Uh, that, that those are more or less the only explicit things that we, we write down. Uh, yeah. Okay, sorry, there's a, a question about, uh, about K being sum of Ki, so maybe at this point I'll, I'll, I, I must say that, um, uh, yeah, I mean, there's a way to do this, but I'll, I'll just say that K, uh, K is just K, 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 right? Uh, so we are in parallel way. Yeah, as, as, we, as we saw in Shonak's talk, non-parallel weights kind of uh, get a little bit more, uh, uh, more technical. So I'll not, I'll stick to parallel weights because that's what we are going to, to be working with anyway. All right, um, so that's the end of the first talk. Uh, there's, there's one more question that I haven't answered yet uh, on the chat that I can see. So is this the only p adical function corresponding to totally real fields? Uh, I mean, yes and no. Uh, so these p adical functions of Delin, Ribet, Kassel, Nogus, <clears throat> these are usually what are called periodical functions attached to totally real fields. So in that sense, yes, but uh, uh, you can take characters of, uh, of higher degree. These are degree one characters. You can use Brouwer induction to, to define periodical functions to those. And those can also be called periodical functions attached to totally real fields. Then there's also the theory of non-commutative uh, periodical functions attached to totally real fields. Uh, yeah, so, uh, so yeah, it depends on what, what kind of thing you are looking for, but, uh, uh yeah, I'll, I'll write the, uh, this, uh, I'll mention Tate's book in the, uh, I'll write it in this chat, but are there any other questions? Yeah, Mahesh, I, I have a couple of questions. So this is again related to this only the PRD Kel function. So is, I mean, this is somehow the PRD Kel function associated to the Tate motive, right? In this context. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay, that's one. And the second one, the, um, so you you said it's, it's the imprimitive ones which uh, somehow interpolate the complex ones. Right. Right, but I've never understood this subtlety. If you know something that which happens at an imprimitive level, you know how the imprimitive um, 
after all, you're, you just have to buff it up with a, a, with a missing oil factors. Yeah. So okay. what happens if you just... Uh... So I, I'm, going to, I'm going to explain this in detail next time that it can't be done uh, in this context of gross star. Okay. Because precisely because this precisely because this Euler factor doesn't periodically continue to uh, to ZP. Okay. okay. So so I'm going to explain this next time. So if you have an Euler factor away from P, mm -hmm. you can periodically continue it to ZP, and you just kind of uh, from whether you put that Euler factor when you interpolate it or or take it out, it doesn't matter because you can just multiply by a simple factor, and and you know what happens. But uh, yeah, but, but if, if this norm of V that I have here, if that is a power of P, hmm. then that thing doesn't make sense periodically. Okay. So, so that, that Euler factor at, at, uh, at primes above P, those don't interpolate periodically. Okay. So, so it's so only, not, it's not even the whole S, it's just the uh, ones above P. Yeah, the ones above P, yeah, those are the only kind of subtle ones. Okay. Thanks. So this is why uh, this phenomenon of exceptional zeros or trivial zeros is a is a difficult one to study. So even over even for uh, L functions of uh, elliptic curves, yeah. um, uh, th there are kind of trivial zeros for periodic L functions and uh, like Greenberg Stevens kind of results, which yeah, are but there but there they arise from the bad deduction, not the ones above P in some sense, right? Uh, That's a bad yeah, I mean, when there's a multiplicative reduction. reduction at P, but those, I mean, this is precisely because you have to you have to sort of alter them at uh, right. Euler factors at P. That's why these uh, these appear. So, so you can't. Uh, I mean, yeah. So, I mean, when it's multiplicative reduction, it's like a, rather than a it, it's a simpler factor. So you can you can try to say whether just. Uh, you know, multiplying it or multiplying it out or in, you can study it, but that's because those factors don't, yeah, I mean, the Euler factor there is not one, even if it's bad reduction, it's something non-trivial and so, uh, which doesn't interpolate periodically. Hmm. Uh, I had a Any question. Other questions? Um, so I'll write the name of that book. Just give me a second. And uh, I mean, you can you can ask the uh, question if you have. But um, yeah, my question was: when the base field is Q, the L values that are rational and which get interpolated are the Bernoulli numbers, and yeah. I think those are very explicit. Right. Um, so this theorem of Shintani, which which tell you that these L values are rational, how explicitly computable are they? <clears throat> Um, yeah, I, I don't know how to interpret that question. Uh, like, can you g give it to a computer and compute it? Oh, yeah, yeah, you can put it on a computer and ask it to, to compute those things, sure. I mean, yeah, so if you if you've heard uh, Shamit speak, and he mentions all these, so he mentions his conjecture on explicit formulae for Brumer Stark units so it's a similar kind of calculation so yeah it can be done explicitly on the computer sure okay. thanks i mean their, their form actually looks very similar to the formula for bernoulli numbers that euler gave uh, uh, but you can't do as much with them as you can do with bernoulli numbers unfortunately thank you uh, there's one more question oh yeah Okay, so why is such a continuation to ZP necessary? Uh, so, um, uh, yeah, so, um, so th I mean, it's an old uh, kind of phenomenon that, uh, so to prove such a continuation, you have to prove uh, congruences between these L values, okay? So the kind of thing that you need to, uh, to prove is, Somehow, if um, k is congruent to k prime modulo p to the t into p minus one, then um, l s chi omega to the uh, k k 
is congruent to L S chi omega to the K prime, K prime modulo P to the T plus one, okay? So <clears throat> for T equal to zero, right? The congruence is mod P. This was already uh, noted by Kumar. This is called Kumar congruence. And so even the generalizations in, uh, for Bernoulli numbers, these are called Kumar congruences. Uh, and so uh, one reason why Kumar would be interested in such a thing is because he proved, uh, he gave a criteria for uh, regularity of, uh, of a prime. So a prime is called regular, P is called regular, if it uh, does not divide the class number of Q mu P, okay? And so Kumar proved that a prime is irregular, so which means that it divides the class number of Q mu P, if and only if uh, P divides numerator of Bernoulli, num Bernoulli numbers uh, in a certain range, okay? And, and that range was somehow, I mean, that range is somehow not important. It, uh, the, the criteria is it, it, it divides denominator, uh, numerator of any Bernoulli number. But because of the congruence, you can, you can, you can restrict it to a certain range. So in that sense, uh, he would be interested in such a congruence, at, at least in that sense. And of course, these are congruences between some important uh, values. So, uh, so, you know, so they, they must have some importance. And so, and, and then Kubota Leopold uh, generalized uh, Kumar's congruences to, ex to precisely the statement that I wrote down here, okay? So that's how this, this thing began. But uh, then Iwasawa noticed that if you have such a p L function, you can, you can, I mean, okay, so sorry, uh, backing up a little bit, if you, I mean, if you want to prove uh, generalizations or, or refinements uh, or, or analogs of this class number formula for L functions, you have to relate uh, L functions to these uh, global uh, invariants like uh, class number and so on. And so, <clears throat> so, so the, the point of Iwasawa theory is that um, this is, uh, uh, Piadic L functions are much more direct, I mean, have a much more direct relation to, uh, to, to these global invariants than complex L functions. So, so Piadic L functions are somehow an intermediate step uh, in relating complex L values to arithmetic invariants. So you pass through, through these Piadic L functions. So that is, the, that is the incentive, that's the motivation behind uh, this. Are there any more questions from Hesh? Yeah, if not, let's thank Mahesh for a great talk.